Okay, we're being recorded. Good morning, everybody. Lovely to see those of you whose names are familiar and to at least e-meet some of you that I haven't met before. So Tom has already gone through our objectives and it's really important. We're just going to go back to the basics to make sure that everybody is clear about how SCAP is supposed to work, because it's probably fair to say that it is an incredibly spit and blue tack process. It is Its success is entirely reliant on every stakeholder knowing what they should be doing and perhaps more importantly, what they shouldn't be doing. Now, as Tom asked you to do, please scan the QR code or um, hopefully if you need it, put your hand up and we'll go back to it because I've got a few polling questions. Nothing dramatic. It's not going to be an exam. I'm more interested just about your perspective, your perceptions, your thoughts on various things, and it'll all make sense as we go through. So why was SCAP introduced? SCAP is not a new concept. It's important to understand that. If there's people sitting around the table who have been in the market for a while, and there's certainly one or two of you I recognise that I know have been, the concept of leader only is not new at all. But what SCAP was trying to do, and it was a drive by the broking community, is to recognise that across the piece, not just in aviation, there are a goodly proportion of claims where there is no value add to insurers, to brokers or to clients by having more than one decision maker involved. And that's across the whole insurer community. Nothing more exciting than that, really. And so the SCAP rules were set up now probably seven odd years ago. And it's important to understand that there are some fairly strict eligibility criteria for what will make any individual claim eligible for handling under the SCAP rules. And the eligibility criteria are both financial and non-financial. So if we look at the financial criteria, the net value, so net of any excesses, deductibles, retentions, whatever, the net value to a slip has to be 250,000 sterling or less. So single slip, all the participants on that slip who have signed up to SCAP is their net share of the claim now, or has any potential to be if there are no reserves on it yet, less than 250,000 sterling. Irrespective of the financials, there mustn't be anything complex or controversial about the claim. And so we'll talk later about Medicare and sanctions and all those sorts of things. And absolutely, there must be no active coverage matters on at all. So just pausing on that eligibility criteria of it being X, Y, Z amount to the slip. Our first practical challenge is verticals. Now, be very clear that the aviation market is not the only market that has fractured signings, whereby you might have five insurers on a risk where you've all signed up to the same risk, but the commercial terms are different. So the prices are different. Maybe the brokerage is different. Because of that, those risks, when they're processed through DXC, have to be signed separately for each insurer because those commercial terms are confidential. Now, for those of you that are pure company market, or for those of you who work for multi-platform insurers, where the company side of your platform, that actually doesn't matter because in the company market, broadly speaking, it's every insurer agreeing their own line. But that fractured signing concept of every insurer on what is ostensibly a single slip, having a separate signing is a real issue on the Lloyd side. And so therefore, if you have a risk and you're a Lloyd's carrier where it is verticalized, those claims should not be handled on ECF at all unless a special artificial claims only signing is created that has none of the commercial confidentials 
but brings all of the Lloyds carriers together. So my first question to you. Hopefully, if you've scanned the QR code and you are in the bit of Slido that says polls, a question should have appeared in front of you. And if you haven't, let me just tell you what the question is. If you handle Lloyd's claims, are you aware of claims FDOs? So it's obviously working. We have got some scores on the doors already. And I can see already we have got a mixture. <clears throat> so I'll just let it go for a couple more minutes just to get the scores in. For you guys that are pure company market, this is not a problem for you at all. OK, well, we've got a few votes in. I don't know how many pure Lloyds people or, or mixed Lloyds people there are on the call. So we've got broadly two thirds of you are aware of them and a third of you are not. So that's something we just need to talk about a little bit more because this fact that the claims shouldn't be handled on ECF unless this uh, false claims FDO signing is set up is part of the business rules of Lloyd's ECF and has been since ECF was introduced in the Lloyd's market back in 2007. And of course, if you're not using them and therefore you might have five Lloyd's syndicates on a claim and each of the five is receiving what is looking effectively like a singleton claim on their ECF because they've all got a separate signing that just is not helpful for SCAP at all. SCAP just won't work in that scenario, OK? OK, thank you for that question. If anybody's got any questions that they want to pose afterwards around these claims, FTOs, then please do let me know. So, let's move on. My next question is for any brokers that we have around the table. Now, I don't know what or how many brokers we have around the table, but if we have got some brokers, let me know what's going on with you and SCAP. <clears throat> we haven't got any brokers, I won't get any votes. Oh, no, we've obviously got one. <clears throat> okay, go on, might be a lone broker sitting around the table. Now, that lone broker has actually, oh no, there's another one. So, so far we've got one other. So, if you're the person that voted other, I'm going to ask you to pop in chat, please, what your other actually is please um somebody who said they don't understand how it works well hopefully we'll resolve that by the end of today <clears throat> or the end of our session today limits are too low we'll come back to that point in a moment so the person that put other are you prepared to just pop something in chat to actually explain what your reason is why you're not using SCAP as a broker if it's not one of the ones I've. OK, thank you. So nice, honest answer there that knows how to use it, forgets to use it. That's fine. Honesty is absolutely fine. OK, so. So far, we've got some not understanding how it works. Underwriters won't agree to it, and we're going to look at that point next. Limits are too low. We're going to look at that point as well, and uh, forgetting to use it. Well, there's not much I can do about that. So thank you to the brokers for our insurers in the room. You vote, please, and let me know why your organisation uh -uh, is not necessarily using SCAP. <laughs> Mm 
Okay, so we've got some um, people going for the other as well. So again, if you're somebody that's uh, used other, if you wouldn't mind popping something in the chat just to say what your other actually is, please. <clears throat> Interesting so far that we're not getting any votes for lack of comfort in the slip leads claims team, because actually when we do the cross market sessions, Tom and I, we actually do quite often get people still saying, actually, no, we're not prepared to use SCAP because we're not happy with XYZ's claims handling. So perhaps that indicates a good degree of comfort within your peer group in the aviation market. So are people that have popped in any other reason are being shy? They're not putting um, their answers into chat. So we're not sure what's going on there, but never mind. Thank you for those votes. And we will move on. <clears throat> so the key point when risks are being placed is to be aware that it exists and to get it into the slip. Because for brokers, that's the starting point is if it's in the slip, then it will be that conversation with underwriters, whether they're prepared to leave it in the slip. Now, it is part of the standard MRC templates. So if brokers are using that, then that should be the default position. Also, it's important to understand what types of contract it is not able to be used on. If your whole world revolves around binding authorities, then it's not usable for those at all. If your whole world revolves around proportional treaty reinsurance, then it can't be used for them either. But if you do open market, if you do line slip, if you do proportional, uh, so non-proportional treaty reinsurance, absolutely it can be used. The other thing, of course, that's very important is who has eligibility to be the slip leader or the term I'm going to use is the intellectual decision maker under SCAP. And there are very clear rules. It can only be a Lloyd syndicate or a UK authorised insurer. Now, it's important to understand that a UK authorised insurer is not just insur an insurer who is a member of the IUA. A UK authorised insurer could be a regional UK insurer. And equally, it's important to understand, for example, that Lloyd's Insurance Company falls under the definition of a UK authorised insurer. Although it is a fully authorised Belgian insurer, and that's the reason it was set up, it also is fully authorised here in the UK and has a UK branch. Now, for you brokers, Whilst you can't use an overseas insurer as the slip lead, as the intellectual decision maker, absolutely, you can try and get them to agree to be bound by the SCAP rules. And that's the very reason that the full wording of the SCAP clause is actually built into the slip template. So actually they can see what they're signing up to. And of course, all very well having it in the slip, but it's really important that the claims people know how to use it anyway. Now, in terms of the choices, Tom. Hi, Charlotte. <clears throat> Just a, a very quick question that I can see has come through via the Slido, and it, it's an appropriate time to raise it, I think. So the, the question is, can company markets based in London fall within the SCAP agreement, or is it just relevant for Lloyd's markets? So I think an important point for, for clarification no, there. A good question, and thank you for drawing to my attention that people were using the Q&A on Slido. I'll keep an eye no on problem. that as well now. So absolutely, there's no reason why if a risk is 100% company market, theor theoretically, that SCAP, SCAP couldn't be used. No, not as far as I'm aware. So yeah, no issue at all. If we've got a mixed market placement, then in terms of the kind of individual insurer decision making about whether to accept it in the slip, <clears throat> it differs between markets because, of course, in the company market, it's very much every carrier for themselves. Then every carrier agrees to it individually just because the Alliance have agreed to be in it in the slip 
AXA don't have to agree to it being in the slip. Obviously, from the broker's perspective, they want as many people signing on the dotted line to be bound by SCAP as they possibly can. It works slightly differently for the Lloyds market in that if a Lloyds leader, so let's say a Chubb syndicate, if they agree to SCAP being in the slip, then all other syndicates that are going to be on that same unique market reference, so effectively in the same slip, are bound to have SCAP in the slip as well. And so for a Lloyd syndicate, if there is a divergence of views or there are some companies that don't want to sign up to SCAP, then what the broker is going to end up having to do is actually create two UMRs, which is going to create an absolute nightmare at the point of a claim. So having those conversations is really, really important early doors. Now, when it comes to the claims, we'll look at this in detail in a moment, but a high level view of the claims process is that <clears throat> because there are three versions of ECF, at least for the next five and a half months in operation in London, one for the Lloyds market, one for the Lerma company market, one for the old ILU company market, irrespective of the fact that there is only potentially going to be one intellectual decision maker, the broker still has to push data down those three pipelines, okay? Now, those three forms of ECF are barely on speaking terms with each other. There's, so there is no real flow of data or communication between them at all, which is why one of the most important messages I'm going to be giving you in a moment is leave it alone, which sounds very counterintuitive, but trust me, it'll make sense when we get there. So the broker has to put data down all three ECF pathways if on their risk they have all three markets. But in the loss name field, because there is no dedicated field on ECF, what the broker needs to do is identify first that they are presenting it as a SCAP claim, and secondly, the market in which the intellectual decision maker lives. And so the beginning of the lost name field in ECF should be SCAP for SCAP, and then one of four different codes to indicate to everybody where the intellectual decision maker actually is. And that will be one of your prime sort of guiding principles as to whether, just because it's appeared in your workflow, you leave it alone or you have to interact with it. <clears throat> now, in the example I've put on the screen, it says SCAP L. And important, L is for Lerma, not L is for Lloyds, OK? S is for syndicate. SCAP L means it's a Lerma intellectual decision maker. So let's say, I don't know, Swiss Re. The key thing is if you are working for a Lloyds syndicate or you're working for a company that you know is an ILU carrier and that claim appears in your workflow, you leave it alone. That is the most important thing to do. You leave it alone because if everything is working properly and we'll talk about when the wheels fall off the bus in a minute, if everything's working properly, then once the Swiss Re claims person has dealt with it. It will go straight to DXC and a mixture of humans and robots will deal with the ILU transaction, will deal with the Lloyds transaction and they will disappear from your workflow. But as I've said, this is an entirely spit and blue tack process. And a lot of the time it doesn't work because stakeholders have not realised what they should or shouldn't be doing to make sure that it does work. But actually, you know, a lot of transactions do go through absolutely perfectly. So they literally go through from the broker, they go seamlessly through to the intellectual decision maker, everybody else leaves it alone, they go through the robots, Overnight messaging comes out as normal, poof, perfect. But there are still quite a lot where it doesn't work properly. And it's a mixture of reasons. Some of the reasons are this claim is never going to go seamlessly through because of the limitations of ECF functionality. Humans need to get involved somewhere down the line. And there's some um, issues there, particularly with Lerma carriers. 
But some of the time the issue is with the broker. So if the slip lead is not a carrier that uses ECF, <clears throat> so it's coded as SCAP NB, the broker should be loading the slip lead comments into the documents for those carriers that do use ECF to look at. And they forget to do that. And so the whole thing comes grinding to a halt. Or, and this is one of the biggest issues, people don't leave it alone. As I said, it's very counterintuitive to have a claim appearing in your workflow and to have somebody saying to you, don't touch it. But absolutely, that is the case. Don't touch it. If you are working for a Lloyd syndicate and you see something appearing in your workflow that says SCAP I or SCAP L or SCAP NB, leave it alone. Now, I will talk about what to do if you're leaving it alone and leaving it alone and leaving it alone and it's still there because that suggests that something gone wrong. But primarily, leave it alone. OK. So. Claims practicalities, absolutely. If you're a claims broker, your starting point is going to be, is it in the slip? Because if it's not in the slip, then you can't present a claim under this protocol. If it isn't in the slip, of course, you then need to work out why it's not in the slip. And if it's not in the slip because the underwriters on that risk refused to have it, then there's probably no way you can go on it. But if it's not in the slip because actually everybody forgot about it at the point of placement and for some reason it's not in the broker's slip template, then there's no reason why you shouldn't try and endorse it on. But obviously that's potentially going to take a little bit of time when you're trying to handle the claim. But all, just always remember that there are certain types of contract that you can't use it for anyway. So I've already used the term slip leader, so that's not a new concept. But in this context, it's the intellectual decision maker, the single intellectual decision maker. But in our example earlier, we talked about the slip lead being in the Lerma market. If there are Lloyd's markets and IRU market on the risk, then they will still have their own bureau leaders. OK, so that is a role that still exists. It has no decision making role, but it's important to know that it's there. And then basically anybody else who has agreed to be bound by SCAP but has no involvement at all in any way, shape or form is just a follow -up. Those are new concepts. Now, I suspect at least some of you are writing business on line slips. Now, whether we were talking about SCAP or otherwise, this is still an important point. You could have a line slip that is led by, for example, I don't know, line slips led by TMK. But that doesn't mean that the leader on every declaration to that line slip will be TMK. Because when the brokers attach declarations onto that line slip, if actually the declaration has security both from the line slip and also perhaps some open market security, there's no reason why the open market security couldn't actually involve the carrier who is going to be the leader on that declaration. So again, super important for the brokers around the table to look very carefully, not just at the line slip, but the declaration documents to see who is the leader. And SCAP can apply equally much to a line slip declaration. OK, and again, look carefully if it appears in your workflow and don't assume just because you lead for example, the line slip that you're going to lead the declaration. So I've talked about the codes. There is no dedicated field. And so the broker needs to put them at the front of the loss name field. And what I mean that they must form the first set of characters in the loss name field. And so SCAP and then I, if it's an ILU slip lead, L if it's Lerma, S if it's syndicate or NB if it is outside the market. Now, word of warning, NB includes Lloyd's Brussels. And you might say to yourself, hang on a minute, Lloyd's Brussels, Lloyd's Insurance Company, their claims are handled on ECF. Not strictly, because remember, Lloyd's Brussels is an insurance company. 
And that insurance company is not using either of the company forms of ECF. So that's why it's categorised as not a SCAP NB. Now, it's really important that that code is set up properly. One, that it's SCAP, not SPAC or any other combination of those four characters, but also that there is a gap between the code and the real loss name, for want of a better word. Really important because the robots at DXC need to be able to see that code. They cannot pick the code out of a continuous stream of data. They need to effectively have clear air around it. OK, it also means that because the robots can identify that it's a SCAP claim, that the creation of the daily SCAP notification report, of which we'll talk more in a moment, that will be accurate and that will be complete. All right. So, as I've said, the broker looks in their slip and goes, is the SCAP provision in the slip? Yes. Do I consider that this claim is potentially eligible for SCAP? Yes. On the Lloyd side, if it's verticalized, do I have a claims FTO in place? Yes. OK. Right. Who's my intellectual decision maker? Right, OK, it's Lloyd's. So I'm going to set it up as SCAP S and I'm going to send data down up to three ECF pipelines if necessary. Now, as I've said, if the slip leader is non-bureau, so an I, a UK authorised insurer, but completely outside the London market, for example, you know, a, a regional insurer potentially, then the broker should be communicating with them first and then putting that exchange of communication in the IMR when they submit it to everybody else. Now, you might say, well, surely we want it all to be done simultaneously. The key thing is that even if it is done simultaneously and so the broker communicates with the non-bureau overall leader as well as with all of the London market, then that claim will still be queried because there will still be a request by DXC for those non-bureau leader comments to be loaded into the IMR before the transaction can be processed. The other thing that's really important is if there are multiple markets, so there's Lloyd's, there's Lerma and there's ILU, the transactions across all the bureaus must remain aligned. And actually, if you look at ECF, you will often see that there might be, say, 10 transactions for the Lloyds market, but there might be 15 for the Lerma market. It doesn't mean that the Lerma market have been told more than the Lloyds market, but actually it's because ECF functionality is different. For example, if a transaction is queried, the answer on the Lerma side comes in as a new transaction. That cannot be done on the Lloyds side. The query transaction must be resolved or deleted and replaced. But if you've got a SCAP claim, you cannot have a dislocate. All of the transactions must be aligned. So the starting point is going to be that the broker considers that the claim is eligible for SCAP. However, the final decision does not rest with the broker. The final decision rests with the intellectual slip leader. Firstly, whether on first presentation, they believe that the claim is eligible to be handled through SCAP, and secondly, at any point in that claims life cycle, whether it is eligible to stay in SCAP, because it might be that when it starts, it is reasonably small, reasonably innocuous, but something comes out of left field partway through and therefore renders it ineligible. And that's absolutely fine. A claim can be taken out of the SCAP process and what will happen then, of course, is on the next transaction, other people will effectively be getting involved in the claim part way through because it will go back to the what I would call you know, non-SCAP traditional claims handling rules. So, for example, in the company market, everybody sees it. When SCAP was first introduced, the business rules indicated that there was also a responsibility on the intellectual slip leaders. So look at claims being presented by brokers, not labelled as SCAP, and go, hmm, that claim really, I think, could be handled under the SCAP rules. 
And remember, we had an honest broker a few minutes ago saying that they're not using SCAP because they just forget that the leaders there would contact the broker to say, hello, I think this claim is eligible for SCAP. Do you want to actually re-release the transaction, putting the SCAP code in there? Now, I don't see that happening very much. I see it happening a bit, but I think that's probably the smallest thing to worry about in terms of getting things right and making sure that the process works properly. So if the slip leader says, yes, I believe that this claim is eligible for SCAP, I'm happy to accept it as SCAP, then they deal with it as normal in whatever version of ECF they're using. OK, and as I've said, and I, I'm going to keep repeating it because this is one of the things that is going wrong over and over again. Everybody else ignores it in their workflow. If everything is working properly, as soon as a slip leader responds to it, it will disappear from everybody else's workflow. As I said, I'll talk about situations where it's not disappearing and what I recommend that you do. If you see something in your workflow that says SCAP NB, everybody can ignore it because it'll just go straight through to DXC and they will respond for everybody. <clears throat> So what will DXC be doing in the background? Well, for anybody who is not the slip leader, DXC through a combination of humans and robots will be going into ECF, responding to the transactions. Overnight messaging will be coming out in the normal way to all markets and the broker will have clarity that they've had responses from all necessary markets. But what will also be going out on a daily basis is something called a SCAP notification report. Now, this is a daily report. It's not a cumulative report, so you've got to keep on top of it as an organisation. And what it does is it allows everybody um, who receives it to just see what's gone on the previous day. You can see where things, for example, have been queried, by the slip leader, but it also allows you to run your own sanctions issues, any regulatory issues that you need to deal with. OK. So these phantom robots of DXC, what do they actually do? Well, the first thing they do, as long as they recognise a claim as being a SCAP claim, which remember they won't necessarily be able to do if that loss name has not been set up properly, is that they will divide all of those claims into two buckets. The ones that the robot thinks it can deal with by itself and the ones that it can't. And the ones that it can't, its human friends are going to get stuck into. So they are usually anything that's slip lead NB, because whilst the robot is going to check whether there are claims documents attached to the transaction, the robot can't actually read them to see what the uh, non-bureau slip leads comments actually were. With Lerma bureau lead first devices, there are additional fields that need to be completed around classes of business and subclass, etc., which the robot can't do for itself. And then, as I've said, if there are problems with the loss name. If the robot can deal with it, they're going to say, right, OK, can I clearly see that it's been coded as a SCAP claim? What is the response of the slip lead? Are they accepting this transaction? Are they agreeing this settlement? And then are there documents both at policy level and at claims level in the IMR? It can't read them. It's just checking whether there are documents there, OK? If there are problems, then what's going to happen is that this particular claim is going to go onto an exception list, i.e. the wheels start to fall off the bus. It's not going to move seamlessly through the process. And there's a number of regularly repeated reasons why this is happening. The first one is that people are not leaving it alone. The second one is that there are not documents attached to the claim. The third one is if somebody who is not the slip leader doesn't leave it alone, they actually query it. Or, and this is the last one is a broker issue, that actually the broker keeps changing the loss name. So, you know, some fairly practical things that can cause problems. 
So if the humans at DXC are getting involved, they will do the same checks as the robots. So they will check what the slip lead has actually done. They will check for documents. But as I've said, if it is slip lead MB, they will actually read those documents. And so, of course, if there aren't any documents there, they will have to query it. And then also, as I've said, they will complete those mandatory fields on a first Lerma transaction. <clears throat> so if you are the intellectual slip leader, what can you do and what can't you do? Well, actually, pretty much you can do everything. You can handle the claim from cradle to grave. You know, you're free to instruct experts. You are free to issue a declinature. But what you need to have clear in your mind is if this is a declinature that has the potential to get controversial, then think about whether actually that needs to come out of SCAP. Now, we already know that SCAP isn't used on binding authorities, but you can have Bordero with other structures. So you might have a Bordero, for example, with a line slip. Absolutely. A leader can handle a Bordero irrespective of the aggregate value of the Bordero, as long as every claim on that Bordero is net to the SCAP signed up insurers on that slip, sub 250. The leader can top up escrows. So in the aviation market, of course, you know, escrows, uh, fee funds, that type of thing. Even if it's over 250,000. If it's in relation to an individual claim, no. But if it's a general escrow that, or loss fund that's being held, for example, by a TPA, that's fine because that's more administrative, okay? Now, how do you take a claim out of SCAP? Well, very simply, <clears throat> as the slip leader or as the broker, you can have a conversation with the other party to say, <coughs> I don't believe this claim is eligible for SCAP anymore. And it might be very simplistic because the numbers have gone too high. Or it might be that there is something non-financial about it that renders it more complex or controversial. Very, very simple methodology to come out of SCAP which is on the next transaction, the broker removes the SCAP code. They're still going to be pushing data down up to three ECF pipelines. And so now, of course, it will appear in everybody's to-do list without that code on it. And if in that circumstance you would normally handle non-SCAP claims, then you get stuck into handling that claim. But of course, the reality is that it might be a claim that's now a good way down its life cycle. So there'll be a little bit of reading in going on. If a claim has gone back into non-SCAP claims handling, so subject to the Lloyd's claims leader um, arrangements or subject to the IUA claims handling rules normally, then it can't go back into SCAP on the unilateral decision of the intellectual decision maker or slip leader. All decision makers have to be engaged with that process. So for you brokers <clears throat> around the table, just a few reminders and FAQs. Keep those transactions lined up, OK? Don't end up with transactions going to one market that are not going to another market. If you want to use a parallel UCR, particularly this is for uh, collection of experts fees, then absolutely that's fine. <clears throat> if the main claim is being handled under SCAP, oh, excuse me. If the main claim is being handled under SCAP, then that parallel UCR can be handled under SCAP as well. But if the main claim is not being handled under SCAP, there is no automatic right to be handling the parallel UCR as a SCAP matter, even though the financials may be considerably sub 250,000. Now, for anybody who is from the ILU market, one of the things that you will often see on ILU ECF is the potential for things to be agreed just by actually a lead or just by the first two ILU companies. If it's a SCAP matter, make sure that the second ILU company is always on it. If as an ILU slip leader, you're obviously doing sanctions checks and you get a positive result, then 
immediately that claim has to come out of SCAT. And exactly the same if it is a personal injury type claim that is Medicare related. Now, I know that there's been some dramatic developments in terms of Medicare reporting and you know, lead companies can now do it on behalf of everybody. But in the context of this, it's got to come out of SCAP. Now, in the Lerma market, the same points exist in relation to sanctions and Medicare or you know, anything else that makes the claim complex or controversial. But in the Lerma market, particularly, you've got the ability to use a lead reserve. Now, that lead reserve, of course, in Lerma is fully visible to everybody, including the broker. But of course, it is not visible to anybody in the Lloyds or the ILU market. So if you're a Lerma carrier and you are the slip leader, please do not use that slip lead reserve field. Now, particularly in the Lerma market, when the followers get the SCAP notification report, one of the reasons they need to be on top of it immediately is that they have one day to object to uh, anything. And this is particularly going to be if a sanctions issue arises. Now, one of the things that has caused quite a lot of confusion is within Lerma ECF, there is a radio button called contractual condition applies. And there are three options. No, yes and small claim, I think. Now, when SCAP was first introduced back in whenever it was, 2017, the instruction to the Lerma market was if you were a Lerma slip leader, you should change that toggle to yes. With the introduction of the DXC robots, that instruction was reversed. The default for that toggle is no. And so the instructions are to just leave it alone. OK. Now, for those of you who are in the Lloyds market, you also have lead reserves, but these lead reserves are not visible to the broker. They're not <coughs> visible to the Lerma or ILU market either. But you can still use them if the only reason you're using them is to split a broker's presented reserve into its constituent parts. So if the broker has presented a reserve for $100,000, which in their narrative they've said is 80,000 indemnity, 20,000 expert fee reserve, then you can and indeed you should use the Lloyd's ECF lead reserves to give those splits so DXC know how to handle it on their system because you are not changing the overall reserve being presented by the broker. And then in terms of fields that you need to deal with, as a leader on the Lloyd's version of ECF, there's not many of them. You can see where they are there. <clears throat> now, in terms of comments, the functionality remains exactly the same. Public comments are visible to everybody across all the markets, as long as the broker has used the same UCR for all markets. But private comments are different. Private comments effectively are market specific, always invisible to the broker. The Lloyd's private comments are probably the most widely visible because they're visible to all MAs and the broker. But in the company markets, particularly private comments are quite often only visible to actually the carrier themselves. <clears throat> so in terms of queries, if you are the slip leader, you are perfectly entitled to query that transaction presented by the broker. So that would be using the query function on the Lloyd side, the inf on the Lerma side, or the pend on the ILU side. What will appear to anybody that receives the SCAP notification report is the fact that you've queried it. So they know the status of that transaction. <clears throat> so just to reiterate, the concept of this is to deal with claims in an efficient and effective way where more than one decision maker adds no real value to the process. However, because of the severe functionality limitations of ECF, basically because we have three versions of ECF that don't talk to each other, it is a very, very spit and blue tack process and entirely relies on each stakeholder knowing what they should be doing. 
And so for brokers, please make sure that you code the claims properly. Now, the threshold, this is an interesting one. Because one of the answers early on was the fact that it isn't being used because the limits are too low. Now, the business rules are that it shouldn't be used for any claim where the potential is over net 250,000 sterling to the slip, to those insurers that have signed up to scab. The robots have no way of interrogating the financials. And so what is happening is claims are being presented on SCAP where the financials are much higher than the business rules permit. Whether it be accidental, whether it be deliberate, I'm not going to go down that line. But the key thing is what it does is it destroys trust in the process. We've got the practicalities of people seeing a claim in their workflow and not leaving it alone. And that completely throws the wheels off the bus because the robots then can't deal with it. Now, I promised that I would give some comments about what you should do if something's been sitting in your workflow and you can hear my voice in the back of your head and you're going, Charlotte says I've got to leave it alone. Charlotte says I've got to leave it alone. But it's still there after, say, you know, five days, 10 days, whatever. It's probably fair to assume that if it is still there, something's gone wrong. But what you can do is you can see what the status is for any other carrier and particularly the slip leader. So if you are a syndicate and you're looking at something in your workflow, it says SCAP L. So you've been diligently leaving it alone. Nothing's happening. If you go into ECF itself, you won't be able to do this if you're looking at it through a write back system. You need to go into ECF itself, open up the claim, and the first screen that you get when you type in the UCR is that you will get a screen that shows you the status of the transactions for all the markets, maybe two or three. OK. So if you're the Lloyd's carrier, and you're looking at this screen and you can see under the transaction for Lerma, it still says awaiting. That means that the Lerma leader has not touched it yet. And so no wonder it hasn't got to the robot. So nothing's gone wrong with the process other than the fact that the Lerma leader has been a slug. But if when you're looking at that screen, you can see that there's a transaction for Lloyd's, but there's no transaction at all for the Lerma market, then every wheel has fallen off that articulated vehicle because that process will not work. Because if there is nothing in the Lerma leader's inbox to actually respond to, how is anything going to work? So that's where a communication to the broker is required to say, hang on a minute, you're loading this up as SCAP L. I can see that there is no transaction for the Lerma market. Try again. OK. We've already talked about the uh, not loading up the non-bureau leads comments. <clears throat> and something I also see is where actually brokers are generating different transaction references <coughs> for the market. <clears throat> so it's the first transaction, <clears throat> but the transaction references are not the same. The robots can't deal with that at all. Now, the clause itself is about six pages long. It is quite long. <clears throat> the guidance documents are about 30 pages long. But they're all there on the LMG website, so you can have a look at them. And as I've said, the current slip templates encourage the full clause to be incorporated, particularly so overseas markets can see what's going on. Now, when we started doing refreshers as a kind of cross-market Body. There was a huge uh, amount of FAQs that were produced. And I think actually in the invitation, Tom included all of those bits of information for you. <clears throat> got some final polling questions for you. So find your device. I will log into mine. Right. <clears throat> so I'm asking you to write a word or phrase. 
which summarises what would encourage you to use it more. <coughs> It's interesting, I've just seen something coming through on the chat that I will respond to in a moment. <clears throat> and Charlotte, just to say, I think we've got a couple of questions in the the Slido Q&A as Lovely. well that we can, okay. we can pick up after. Thank you. OK, so what have we got here? We've got accuracy, we've got simplicity. <coughs> yeah, accuracy, simplicity, efficiency. <coughs> yeah. The concept is absolutely fundamental in that it is actually a very, very simple concept. But as I've said, it absolutely relies on every stakeholder to know exactly what they should be doing and they shouldn't be doing. And to be perfectly blunt, this hasn't been happening at all, which is why those benefits of efficiency actually have not been achieved at all. Thank you for that. I've got a last question. And then I will look at the questions in the chat and respond to the questions in the chat. OK. <clears throat> right, there's a few votes in. I'll, I'll wait for a few more to come in because I'm sure everybody's got a view on this. But interestingly, so far of the votes that are in, it's two thirds saying no and a third saying yes. So while I'll, I'll leave that open and just watch for that to come in, and I'm just now going to address the things that have come up in the chat. So one um, uh, comment has come in, which is actually uh, identified what I think is a misunderstanding because every market sector is still subject to exactly the same business rules that the SCAP limit is 250,000 sterling net. There has been quite a lot of chatter about differential limits for different markets, but that has not come to anything. So everybody is currently at 250. Now, there are a number of views, of course, with the changes that occurred in the Lloyds market last year, with the upping of the limits for uh, standard claims within the Lloyds market, there was some discussion about whether that was a good point to start thinking about pushing the SCAP limits up as well. But I think there were some fairly strongly held views that as a market, so this is not pointing at anybody, this is a market as a whole community, if we can't get it right yet at the limits we currently have it, then there is going to be little or no enthusiasm potentially for actually opening up a wider population of claims to be handled badly through this mechanism. So be clear, no other markets are in any better if one wants to put it that way position or any different position to the aviation market. Everybody is working to the same rules of the 250. Now, the next point is about uh, Lloyd's Brussels. So. This is where if you have got. A claim that is on. Uh, a mixed placement. So part of it 
is on um, Lloyd's. So the Lloyd's stuff is done as Lloyd's Brussels. And you've got company market. That Lloyd's Brussels stuff, of course, is done through the Lloyd's version of ECF. Be done sort of over here. Theoretically, the company bit could go through as SCAP on the basis of SCAP NB. Sounds a bit odd, but the theory sounds where actually the comments from Lloyd's Brussels or effectively the managing agents acting on behalf of Lloyd's Brussels could be attached to those company carriers responses. The other time that you could see it is right at the beginning of the existence of Lloyd's Brussels. So in the early days of 2019, before we came out of Europe formally, there was a four or five months where managing agents particularly had the choice about whether to write business using the Lloyd's Brussels stamp or whether to use their main managing agency stamp. And so there are some risks that date back to then that could have Lloyd's Brussels on them, ordinary syndicates on them, as well as companies. And again, the same principle could apply. So it's it's messy. And one of the things that neither Tom nor I know, because we don't have crystal balls, uh, is how ICOS is going to deal with this. As I said, you know, we've only got three versions of ECF that don't talk to each other, hopefully for another five and a half months. We don't know at the moment how SCAT generally is going to work through the ICOS platform. So if you've got Lloyd's Brussels stuff being handled through the Lloyd's version of ECF, then all of those requirements that you've mentioned in your comments about the proper handling of BAT and how DXC will capture it on the Lloyd's system to then come out to the managing agents as the FACRI, none of that changes at all. The next point is <coughs> if you're a syndicate where Lerma hasn't processed, the point made here is if you've got a different UMR. If you've got a different UMR, so a completely separate contract reference, there with so two different markets ostensibly on the same risk but on different contract references then there is no ability to bring those two together and handle them as SCAP. Within the individual UMRs, you can group the insurers together, but not across UMRs. If as a bureau leader, you accidentally touch and engage and respond to a transaction where you should have left it alone, that doesn't bounce the entire claim out of SCAP. What it means is that that transaction can't be handled by the robots. It'll be you know, subject to a human interface. Everything will take longer and be more painful. But the broker can still present the next transaction as a SCAP transaction and all things being equal, it can go nicely through the system. So those are the ones on chat. Let me have a quick look at the ones on Slido and see how the votes are going on that. OK, so not much enthusiasm for the voting on that question but for the people that did vote it still came out more as no to a million than yes so let's have a look at a couple more questions um so if the scap claim is a third party claim where the third party is potentially sanctioned like a passenger does this no longer qualify for scap absolutely right that comes out of scap what should be done by the SCAP parties if the claim is quantum TBA but might end up above the SCAP limit? The key thing, if you are the intellectual decision maker, if the quantum is currently TBA, you should use your um, decision making capabilities to say, where do I think this claim is going to go? And if you think it has the potential to go above the SCAP limit, albeit it's not there now, then it is your decision as the slip leaders to say, no, this game, this claim does not go into SCAP because you know you're going to, it may be coming out of SCAP fairly quickly. So even if the claim reserve is zero, but you think it has the potential as the intellectual decision maker to go above the SCAP limit, then keep it out of SCAP. 
So do the DXC robots have the ability to pick up on an auto remove scan where the reserves have now exceeded 250,000? Absolutely not. And that is one of the big problems. The robots have no ability to spot where claims that are coming through coded as SCAP have got numbers that make them ineligible for SCAP. And that's one of the biggest problems that is being found is that ineligible claims are being pushed through. And as I've said, I don't know, and, and you know, whether it is something where broker and slip leader are doing it deliberately because they believe that it should be a higher limit. And, you know, why should they be constrained to just 250? I genuinely hope that that's none of you. It's more likely I would like to think that it's accidental. But no, there are no uh, net nanny controls in place for that at all. And again, you know, I can only reinforce, and I know it sounds like a really odd thing to keep saying, but one of the limitations of SCAP is it can only work to its best effect. And, you know, conceptually, it's a really good idea. If everybody, every stakeholder understands their step in the process and what they need to be doing and equally not doing to make it all flow beautifully. OK. So over to you now for any more questions. We've still got another sort of 15 minutes or so. Obviously, we're not going to use up your time unnecessarily. Thank you for those questions that have come through on chat and on Slido. Again, if you want to put more in there, you know, anonymously or otherwise, feel free. Thank you very much, Charlotte, for, for taking us through the slides there. I think we, we hit lots of the points that have been raised at various sort of market discussions and you know certainly at our junior aviation claims group in particular um i can see we, we've got one question that, that's come in and i wondered also whether perhaps somebody who may have attended our, our junior aviation claims group meeting yesterday i, I know we've got olivia on the call chairs group might want to mention just some of the examples of of scap errors that we've seen recently and, and probably extending back a little bit further than that you know, perhaps on naming. Um, so Charlotte, shall I let you pick up the question in the chat and then maybe we can see if anybody wants to raise their hand and, and come in on on the points I raised? Yeah, absolutely. Let me pick up the question in the chat and then I'll, I'll pass over to uh, Olivia or, or Amy. So ICOST is the replacement for all three versions of ECF. So a single unified claims platform that will be, all things being equal and I remain positive, going live on the 1st of July, and it will be a big bang crossover. If you are working for an insurer where you are using a right back system, so you use Docusoft or SQL or something like that, then those will hopefully still be able to interface with it. So in, you know, from that perspective, that will make your lives a little bit easier. From um, the broker's perspective, there will be some changes going on in terms of how data is presented. Um, but it is a potentially dramatically different system. Um, I've not seen any um, uh, screen grabs or any sort of wireframes or anything about it as yet. What I will do is I will send a document that I'll ask Tom to send around to all attendees, just one page, which sets out basically from the claims perspective, what you can do today that you'll still be able to do tomorrow, what you couldn't do today that you will be able to do tomorrow, what you can do today that you won't be able to do tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the key differences is it's no longer going to be a system that is totally driven by brokers loading transactions. There is going to be a lot more ability for insurers to actually update their own claims and drive things. So there is not much out there about it at the moment, but certainly for those of you claims people sitting around the table, I encourage you to get stuck in as much as you can to testing it um, in the next few months when that opportunity arises, because, yeah, it may not be around for the 40 years at ECF has been, or certainly on the company side, um, but it's going to be around for a while and you're going to be using it. So, yeah, I'll get some stuff sent around to you. 
Okay, Olivia, morning, sorry, Tom. Just, sorry, just very quickly, Charlotte. You're more than more than happy to share the the document that you've mentioned, and and we made a similar point at, at actually a meeting we had yesterday, which is to say that we are expecting that at a market level there will be far more engagement opportunities, as you mentioned, you know, cropping up over the next couple of months. So hopefully that will be the time when you know far more light is shed for for everyone, particularly for practitioners. I think you know inevitably yeah. there are always working groups or um or, or specific individuals within companies that are tasked with getting involved in the in in the market discussions to to build and develop these platforms but ultimately you know it's the it's the practitioners you know around this table and, and around all of our class of business committees that are saying you know how will this affect me so mm. you know keep an eye out we will certainly mm. as soon as it's available be sending on you know invitations mm. and material so you know, j just keep that in mind um, and Charlotte, sorry, we'll we'll pass on to Olivia as as you mentioned, if if she's here and and happy to chip in. Yeah, yeah, no problem if you can hear me. Okay. Um, yeah. <clears throat> really, it was everything that you've already said, Charlotte. That we in the junior team have been um, facing with the no space between um, Scappy and uh, loss name, or um, a couple of instances it's been over 250,000. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask actually quick, sh quickly, if on the um, escrow loss fund uh, mm. questions, mm. is there any limit at all as to how much can be topped up, etc.? I know you said it, you can go over the 250, but is there any limit in place at all for how much no. one person can release under SCAP? No. No, no. But I think um, the, dif the difference with your stuff um, your your fee fund type stuff is that tends to be in relation to a particular claim. And so if those claims are going to be big enough. They're going to be outside SCAP anyway. But if you've got a situation where, I don't know, something like um, aviation baggage claims that are being handled by a TPA and they've got a loss fund, mm -hmm. then absolutely, because, because topping up the loss fund is effectively administrative, um, then there's no limit on that at all. Great, thank you. I don't think there was anything else massively to add. It seems like you covered everything. So just thanks from the junior team, Charlotte. Really, okay. really helpful. My pleasure. Okay, well, we're into to last chance territory for any <laughs> final questions or comments, at least for the purposes of this call today. Um, it, it's probably important to say that you know if you do have any questions or examples of issues I, I know that Charlotte you're always very happy to receive those kind yeah. of questions via yeah, email yeah. and equally you know if, if you'd like to pass them mm -hmm. on to to me on the IUA side I will then most likely pass them on to Charlotte so um whatever way whatever way works best yeah yeah absolutely happy to happy to pick up any points or any answer any other points happy to help so give people 15 minutes back in their lives. Absolutely. Why Why not? Um, Charlotte, was there anything more that you wanted to say just before I, I close up? No, that's it from me. OK, fantastic. Well, just very briefly then um, to, to, to one of Charlotte's really important points on the, the SCAP limit. We are continuing to have discussions at an association level. So ourselves, LMA on the Lloyd side and, and Libra representing the broking community about the the current SCAP threshold and also considering the important points that Charlotte mentioned about ICOS and, and the future market platforms. So we will continue to have those discussions and of course bring our respective members in to ensure that all views are, are heard and understood. You know, in, inevitably there will be uh, market consultations probably within the various communities, however the associations decide to, to run them. Um, for the purposes of, of this meeting today, we will share the link to the recording with all of the attendees and we'll probably encourage you to share it a little bit more broadly because I know that there were some people who hoped to join us today and haven't been able to. I'm certainly keen to, to get the information that we've been able to share as broadly as, as we possibly able to. Um, apart from that, I think really just to thank Charlotte for her time and, and what was another very insightful session. Um, we will of course stay in touch with the aviation community on all things SCAP if there are other issues arising as we mentioned. 
and then finally just to thank you all for taking the time to join us and as charlotte said we'll give you back 15 minutes and i'm sure catch up soon so thank you all very much Take care. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Charlotte. Excellent as always. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Cheers.